This is a 2011 Bentley Continental Super Sports. In this video, we're going to take a look at the exterior and interior features so you can learn more about the car. First things first, this is based on the Bentley Continental line, which has several levels and variations within those levels. The base level is the regular Continental, which comes in the Flying Spur, which is a four-door sedan, as well as the GT, which is the Coupe, which comes in the regular GT, as well as the GTC, which is a convertible. The level above that is the Continental Speed. The Speed comes in the, in the Flying Spur and the GT variations as well. It has more horsepower and ability. Finally, the GT has a level above that, which is the Super Sports. And the Super Sports is Bentley's fastest car and best performer. There are some exterior differences between the Super Sports and other Continental models. The most obvious difference are the hood vents. Now on the air dam, at least in this model, the vents on the side come up a little higher than the main vent. The Super Sports come standard with black rims. Of course, those can be changed. And right behind those front wheels is the one spot in the Super Sports where it actually says what it is. Coming in the back of the car, the Super Sports actually has a small spoiler which deploys from right here and that automatically deploys when the car passes 90 miles an hour, but it can be manually deployed, of course. And here is the spoiler deployed. Let's take a look inside of the trunk. Like many cars of this caliber, it can be remotely opened. For a car of this size, it has a pretty sizable trunk. You can easily fit two small pieces or one very large piece of luggage and there's access to the cabin as well. To close, they've got a nice button or you can simply manually close it. Now let's take a look inside. This particular Super Sports has an additional option, the comfort seat package, where instead of the form-fitting carbon fiber seats, it goes back to the comfort seats available on the other Continental models. If this were a regular Super Sports, it wouldn't have the rear seats. It would have a crossbar and then a limited amount of storage. As you can see, a lot of the panels are carbon fiber. The crisscross pattern in the fabric is also unique to the Super Sports. Like other Bentleys, and even Rolls Royces, there are the old-fashioned air vents with the pipe organ toggles. Bentley has taken the time to develop a weight to these buttons to make it feel like the old-fashioned vents where a leather piece would move in and out of place to block the vent. Let's go ahead and turn it on. This particular model is keyless. The ignition on a Super Sports is right here. Nice low rumble as the car adjusts to the settings on this particular key. Parking brake. This is to adjust your mirrors. The car has a six-speed gearbox, automatic, with what they call quick shift technology. Just sort of a tiptronic here on the side of drive. In addition, there's a speed setting to get a little more automatic performance out of the car. The car has comfort seats. Going in this direction makes it hot. I've seen some variations of the Continental where you can turn it in the other direction and it'll make the seat cooler. This is to control the suspension on the car. On the screen you have the option to go towards either a comfort or a sport setting to tighten them up. This is to move the spoiler manually up and down. 
This is to actually control the profile of the car. It uses an air suspension, and if you're concerned about hitting bumps or dirt, you can optionally make the car a little higher, and the car will move subtly higher as it does. It's hard to show from a video, but if you're in the car with a foot on the ground outside, you can feel the car raising up. In addition, the hazard lights and just basic storage. The center console gives you access to a number of the car's interior features. The user interface could be better, but it doesn't take too long to learn. The bottom rows allow you to choose what the screen will do, on and off, obviously. Uh, reset the system, the AC system, or the climate control. From here, for example, you can use the center knob to increase. And then these side buttons become what is displayed on the screen. So for example, to change where things are going, pretty self-explanatory. The audio system has radio, DVD, CD changer, as well as satellite radio. There is a navigation system and a map. The map and the navigation system on this vehicle, in my opinion, are not particularly great. There's also a trip option phone if you want to connect your car to a Bluetooth device, information which will show the general location of the car, the vehicle options which will go through and again give you what's going on inside the vehicle, um, for example tire pressure, help options as well as setup if you need to control what key fob has what settings. Going back to climate control, turn this down so we get less air noise, the other options are up here to control temperature as well as this particular button sets all seats to the driver's seat in terms of climate control um, and then your other standards recirculate air and the defoggers. To the right of the steering wheel we have three options the option to reset the trip meter, the option to turn off traction control and the parking distance control which is basically a sensor system like you'd find on other luxury cars BMW, Mercedes, Rolls Royce, etc. This car also has a rear camera. This will let you have an idea of where the car is going to go. The yellow lines are where it projects the side of the car to go. The red line is where it thinks it's safe to back to before the back of the car will hit something. As you can see as I turn the wheel, the yellow lines move. The green section is essentially if your car were to go directly backwards where it would go. It'll eventually turn off once you put it in drive. To the left of the wheel, you have your standard headlight and dash light controls, um, fog light, and to maneuver the uh, to manipulate the uh, dash lights up and down in terms of brightness. Your dials are pretty self-explanatory: RPM, speedometer, fuel, temperature. The center screen can be changed to do a variety of display a variety of things. I've currently got it to just miles an hour, but again, um, you can set it to display consumption, uh, your current consumption, your current speed, range, distance remaining, etc. Steering wheel itself, I should have mentioned, has an option to change uh, what's being displayed in the middle, as well as your standard phone options, volume, and the ability to uh, access uh, cruise control if you decide to use cruise control. As on Bentley, in addition to the windows on the side on the Continental, you have the ability to also open the trunk, and this is the fuel door button on a Continental. I know a lot of people sometimes, when they initially get one, get confused where it is. So that's the interior. It's pretty self-explanatory. Let's give a little engine rev. The interior of this car sounds exceptional when the engine is revving. Let's lower the window a bit. If you're so inclined, there are also paddle shifters on either side of the steering wheel. And in addition, above there are some light features and the ability to program in garage door openers. Nothing too exceptional there. So let's go ahead and take a look under the hood. So once you pop the hood from the inside, the B and the emblem comes up, and that's actually how you unlock the hood in a Bentley. 
So there you have it, a 6 liter W12. It produces 621 horsepower with 590 pounds of torque. This car has a top speed of over 200 miles an hour. Of course, that's something you should do only on a controlled course. If the car happens to come close to passing 160 or above, a warning light and chime come on to let you know that the tires need to be pressurized for that particular speed. The wheels also happen to have 16.5 inch carbon ceramic brakes, which are among the largest available. Now let's take a look at this car in action. I've had several thousand miles of experience with this car, so now I'd like to tell you about at least a few of the flaws that I've noticed over time. The bold design of the exterior is a plus, but it also leads to one problem with the rear wheel well. If you take this car onto roads with just a little bit of loose dirt or gravel, and a lot of the fun, otherwise paved, twisty roads sometimes have them, you'll develop road rash right above the rear wheel as dirt is shot up from the front wheel. This car is aimed at executives and people who would probably have a suit in the back at one point on a hanger. Well these rear coat hangers look nice but have absolutely no practical use. Things will fly off of these in even the lightest turn. Service on this car has also been a problem. We've had two different issues with the air conditioning system, and after the first time, it broke again, almost immediately. It also took months to get parts to fix it. Coming from the air conditioning issues, I had to use a sun visor quite a bit. This is what the sun visor should look like. But this bracket is not well designed. This particular metal piece will sometimes go down a little too far and jam so that this visor can no longer be placed back easily. So what happens as a result? That happens as a result. But the nice thing is, once it actually came out, I could see the poor design that was involved. This particular centerpiece is what's supposed to keep it locked into place. Didn't work properly. This top bracket doesn't connect very well. In fact, it, it's a pretty poor design. Somebody went to school, became an engineer, and designed this. What I can say, however, is the engine, the steering, the performance of the actual car part of this vehicle is stupendous. But when it comes to the little things, the coat hanger, air conditioning, holding up a visor, there are a lot of flaws and a lot of things that are left to be desired. Frankly, I've seen better in the Rolls Royces that I've reviewed. Those are my thoughts. Thank you for watching.